Welcome back to another episode of the Dozen Debrief. Today we're going to be talking about George. I, I mean, autopilots. Uh, automatic pilot, automatic pilot. So who's George, right? George is the person that we use when we reference autopilots. Turn on George, right? And the funny thing is nobody actually knows where that comes from. So there's a couple different theories out there. One is that back in the 1930s, a guy named George DeBeeson invented and patented the autopilot, right? So some people think that that's where it comes from. We don't know, either way, we call him George. What is the point of autopilots? Why do we have autopilots? How good are they? Are they gonna be used to replace pilots in the future? Uh, I don't think that that's gonna happen in the near term. Can you fly airplanes autonomously without pilots? Yes. What are the pros and cons? So autopilots are really designed for a best case scenario and they're designed to increase the level of situational awareness so that the pilot can focus on other things and not be as focused on basic aircraft control. The best way to think about an autopilot is a co-pilot, right? We call him George. If George starts doing something funny, you don't like what they're doing, take the airplane away from it. Allow them to reduce your workload so you can focus on a bigger picture and keep your situa situational awareness high. Where do autopilots come from? Right? How long have they been around? And surprisingly, they've been around for a very, very long time. So you think of Wright Flyers flew in 1903, literally less than 10 years later in 1912, you had the Sperry Corporation come out with their very first autopilot. Was it rudimentary? Yes. Did it work? Kind of. Since then, they've evolved that. So moving forward in history, we have 1930. In 1930, the US Army Air Corps had a proof of concept. And for the first time, they flew an airplane for three hours on a true heading with a very basic flight control system that used a gyroscope to be able to keep the aircraft straight and level. And if it started getting off heading, it would bring it back. Fast forward a couple of years to 1947, a couple of years after World War II was over, the United States Air Force at that time now used a uh, C-53, which is a cargo aircraft, and took off, flew across the Atlantic and landed without the pilot ever touching the airplane. A complete autopilot transatlantic crossing in 1947. So this technology has been around for a while. So let's talk about the different levels of autopilot. There's basically three different levels of autopilot. You have a single axis, a two axis, and a three axis autopilot. So a single axis autopilot, your cheaper, more basic autopilots, basically control roll. But if the aircraft starts getting a little bit out of bank, there's electric servos that will help that aileron deflect just a little bit to get the wings back to level. The basic level of these uh, work pretty well. Uh, the more advanced ones will actually help uh, combine with a GPS system or some other type of navigation system to fly from point to point, as opposed to flying just a heading. To jump in a second axis, now you have uh, servos not only on your ailerons, but you can get it on your elevators. And so what that will do is that will allow the aircraft not only to roll the direction you want, it will also help the aircraft pitch the way that you want. So you can climb, you can descend. If combined with the GPS or some type of instrument approach, you can actually shoot instrument approaches with it. Uh, and so that's the second axis. The third axis is used in the yaw axis. So if you think about using the rudder to keep the aircraft going straight, that can really help with efficiencies to the aircraft and a lot of other uh, advantages, right? If you have an aircraft that's flying into the wind like this, it's a lot of resistance against it. But if you can make sure that it's flying true, then it's a lot more efficient uh, and uh, just helps with a, a few other features there. So one axis, two axis, three axis. So how do autopilots change depending upon whether you're flying general aviation, military, commercial? Uh, they all have kind of different mission sets and so they all, while they work similarly, kind of the importance and need of them changes depending upon what your mission set is. So in general aviation, uh, generally these are pilots who are wanting to get from point A to point B and try to decrease workload a little bit, make it safer for flying instrument approaches and things like that. So you're not as task saturated as you're doing those things. And the evolution of it has kind of evolved quite a bit. So in my airplane and my debonair, I have a Century 1 and a Century 2 autopilot. Yes, that's two autopilots and neither one of them are particularly that great. Uh, they're both old. Uh, they're both a single axis autopilot, right? So all it does is helps bank the wings where you need it to be, but it'll kind of point you in the right direction. When you jump into the military, the mentality around autopilot changes pretty dramatically. Right? So when you jump into the T6 Section 2, the, the current trainer for both the Navy and the Air Force, uh, you, you have no autopilot. Right? You have to fly the airplane. The point of the training program is to learn how to fly an airplane. So why are you going to put an autopilot in it? Uh, when you jump into the F-16, right, this is a, an awesome fly-by-wire aircraft. And its capability is not much more advanced. It can fly level. You can set a certain angle of bank. You can have it hold that angle of bank. You can steer up to 10 different steer points where it'll steer between 10 different steer points. And that's about it. Can you use it for dogfighting? No. And I think that's why you don't see really advanced 
autopilots in fighter aircraft. The F-35 has uh, auto throttles and a little bit more advanced autopilot, but still, it's compared to what you get in the civilian world, very, very, very basic. Now, let's talk about the commercial. We've already talked about the Airbus uh, 321, uh, the 320 series, the 737, the 787, doesn't matter what airplane it is. Commercial aircraft, if you have more than about 20 people in your aircraft, the FAA actually mandates that you have an autopilot system in your aircraft. The whole point of it is to make it easier for the pilots to fly so they can focus on other things, right? Whether it's radio calls, uh, looking at weather and figuring out how to get around it. It allows you to let the airplane kind of fly for a while so that you can focus on other priorities and decrease the workload of the pilot. How advanced can they get? They can get super advanced. So if you look here at the Airbus A320, uh, the airplane I fly uh, right now, this thing can fly what's called a CAT-3 ILS. So an ILS is an instrument approach that you use to get below the weather when the weather's not very good, right? You can't see the runway, you gotta get onto the runway. And there's a CAT-1, CAT-2, CAT-3. CAT-3 is what we call a zero, zero landing, which means you don't have to see the runway to land. And when I say you land, you're not really landing. The airplane is landing. So what the airplane will do is it will track a beam that's being produced from the ground, combine it with the GPS and all the other features it has in the aircraft, and it will fly the aircraft down this beam all the way. And once it starts getting close to the runway, it has a radar altimeter, knows how close it is to the ground. It will go, it will flare, it will touch down. It has automatic brakes, so it'll automatically start slowing down and it knows where the center line of the runway is, so it will adjust the nose wheel steering in order to keep center line of the runway, and it will come all the way to a complete stop without the pilots ever doing a single thing. It's pretty advanced flight control systems. One threat that autopilots have is that it really has a potential of decreasing pilot proficiency. So if all you do is fly commercial aircraft all the time, you don't do general aviation aircraft, you don't fly other stuff, and at, as soon as you take off, you rotate, you turn the autopilot on, you're managing the autopilot the whole way around, you do the approach with the autopilot, you let the aircraft land, your skills can really start to atrophy on your ability to handle the aircraft. Autopilots is only as good as the data that's going into it. So if your flight control surfaces start to freeze, start to have failures, you get a pitot tube that's blocked and it doesn't have the information it needs, it can't do what it needs to do. While autopilots have an incredible important role in safety of aviation, once things start going sideways, you really need somebody in the airplane who can think dynamically and fly the aircraft in a degraded state because the autopilot's great when everything's working perfect. So, autopilot is a great tool. It is a huge asset that can be used if used correctly, but if relied on exclusively or not taken over at the appropriate time, it can be a huge risk that it can actually lead to situations being much worse. Pilot only has so much processing power. And so if you need to land in a zero zero situation, you need the autopilot. At the same time, when the autopilot starts having issues, it needs the pilot. And so it's this beautiful symbiotic relationship that's needed. And I think this is gonna be the future of aviation for a long time. <laughs>